What's happening guys? Welcome to the full ANPR, so Automatic Number Plate Recognition course. In this video, we're going to be going through everything you need to do to be able to go up and get started with advanced automatic number plate recognition. We'll be able to use our webcam as well as some images to be able to detect license plates and eventually apply OCR to be able to extract the text that we've detected in it. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. What's happening guys? Welcome to the automatic number plate recognition full course. Now in this video, we're going to go from start all the way to finish to be able to build a full blown automatic number plate recognition system, something which is pretty, pretty cool. Now in this particular video, we're going to cover being able to detect license plates and extract the text from an image as well as from a real time video feed. So later on in the video, you'll actually see that we'll throw up a plate on my phone I point it at my camera and ideally that should detect the plate from that particular video and perform some OCR to be able to grab the text from the number plate. Pretty cool, right? Now, in this video, we're going to cover a bunch of stuff. So let's take a look as to what we'll actually be going through. So first up, what we're going to be doing is installing and setting up our environment and everything we need to get up and running. Then what we're actually going to do is get our license plate data. So this video is a little bit different to my traditional object detection videos in that we're actually going to be using a pre-annotated data set rather than one that we've gone and collected and annotated ourselves. So it's going to be slightly different in that respect. So we're actually going to be using some Kaggle data for this particular video. Now, once we've got our Kaggle data, we're actually going to be training an object detection model. And you'll see why we're doing this in the next slide when I explain how the system's going to work. So we're gonna train an object detection model to be able to detect our license plate. So you'll actually see that it detects our region of interest and it shows up as a license plate. Now, the reason that we're doing this is that it's way more accurate and way more resilient than using traditional computer vision techniques. So if you watched my previous AMPR video, you might've noticed that if you threw up different types of number plates or if you applied it to number plates in different regions, it might not have been as resilient as you might've liked it to be. Well, this model is going to perform infinitely better than that particular approach, which is why we're going through this. So once we've detected the number plate, we're then actually going to detect some number plates. Also, once we've actually trained the model, we're then going to detect some number plates. So we'll do it on an image as well as a real-time video feed. And then we're actually going to apply our OCR step, which is step five over here. So for our OCR, we're going to be using a library called Easy OCR, and this is going to be able to extract the text from the detected license plate feed. And we can do this in both real time as well as on a standard image. Now, where I wanted to take this is one step further. So step six is actually going to allow us to build up a little bit more of a system. Now, one of the common things that you'll notice in production grade pre-built AMPR systems is that it will detect the number plate, but it'll also save out and log some of the results. So you'll actually be able to have and review the regions of interest or the plates that have been detected previously. You'll also be able to search through those. Now, I wanted to mimic that a little bit in this particular video. So what you're going to see is that we'll detect the plate, but then the system's actually gonna save that region of interest. I know I'm getting excited, but it's such a cool thing. It's gonna save that region of interest to our machine. So we'll actually be able to go through and view all the plates that have been detected, and we'll have a corresponding CSV sheet that'll have the name of the image that represents that region of interest, as well as the plate that's been detected or any of the text that's been detected in that plate. So all together, that should give us a full-blown AMPR system. Now on that note, let's kick things off and start taking a look at our setup. So in step one, we're really going to be going through our setup. Now, in terms of what we're going to be doing, let's take a look at how it's all gonna to fit together first up. So the system that we're going to be building is really comprised of two key elements. Now, the first element is our object detection model and the core purpose, the sole reason for existing or for that particular component existing is to be able to extract out our regions of interest. Now, it's pretty verbose in what it means. It's the region of a particular image or video that we're interested in. Now, in this case, our ROI or our region of interest is going to be the license plate for that particular vehicle or vehicle. Now, <laughs> so you can actually see this on the right hand side of our image here. So we've got, I might actually be covering out this bottom region. So we're actually going to be detecting the region of interest for our particular number plate. So you'll actually see that over here. And this is what our object detection model is actually going to do for us. 
then our second element in our AMPR system is actually going to be Easy OCR. And Easy OCR is going to be what allows us to extract the text from the images. So again, two-part system, first part detects our license plate, second part actually extracts the text. Now, in terms of how this all fits together, so we're going to be using our webcam. In this case, you could go and deploy it. You could go and leverage a whole bunch of other systems. And this is going to be very GPU reliant in this particular case. But we'll be using our webcam to grab an image of a plate. So you'll see later on that I throw up a plate on my phone and we'll try to do that. Then TensorFlow object detection will initially kick in to detect our region of interest based on the trained model on our Kaggle dataset. So you'll see that it tries to detect our license plate, which is this little green box that you can see here. Then last but not least, we're going to use Easy OCR to actually grab this region here. I'm probably blocking this text over here, but you can see uses Easy OCR to extract text and leverages a side filtering algorithm to grab the largest detection region. So when I was building this, I had to try to think of a way to only pick up the bigger blocks of text. So you can see here that we've got BG02QT, but then we've also got this slightly smaller area over here as well. So what I did is I came up with a small algorithm which effectively tries to categorize the size of the detected region. So basically we can tune that particular threshold. So so originally what I said is that if the plate, so in this case, you can see that red line here. So the box is actually this. If the detected text is 60% of the area of our region of interest, then that's going to be our text. But again, you can play around with this. We'll dive into that in more detail later on. So that about summarizes how this is all going to work. Now we need to get up and running and start installing all of the stuff that we're going to need for this particular video. So there's going to be two components, as I was saying, the TensorFlow object detection bit and easy OCR. So what we're going to do is we're going to get up and running with TensorFlow object detection, train our model, and then we'll go and apply our additional overlays to actually be able to go and perform AMPR. So let's go on ahead and get this started. So I'll show you where you can get this code and we'll start building up. So. In terms of getting up and running with our TensorFlow object detection model, we're going to be using the code that we wrote for my full-blown TensorFlow object detection course. Now, again, that entire video is available on YouTube. So if you actually go to my channel, you can see that it's over here. It's a five hour long video, so pretty long, but it goes through all of the basics of getting up and running with TensorFlow object detection in pretty great detail. So. What we're going to do is do exactly that and leverage that particular model to be able to detect our license plate. So what we're going to do is copy this link here. So this link is github.com forward slash nicknocknack forward slash TFOD course. And we're going to open up a new command prompt. And I'm going to go into my D drive, but again, you can do this into any drive that you want. And I'm going to create a directory called AMPR. So we're going to just type in MKDR AMPR. So this is going to create a new folder, and then I'm going to go into that folder. And if I show you what this looks like, it's really just a folder. So you can see that I've gone and created this folder here, AMPR. Let's zoom in on that so you can see. Folder called AMPR, nothing too crazy there, right? It's just a folder. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to clone in all of those assets from the TensorFlow object detection course into that folder. So let's go on ahead and do that. So to do that, I'm going to type in git clone, paste the link, and then at the end of it, I'm just going to include dot. Now, what this is actually saying is git clone. So clone this repository here. So HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash github.com forward slash nick knock knack forward slash tfod course and then the dot at the end of it which you can see sorry my mouse is playing up the dot that you can see here is basically saying clone all of the stuff from that particular repository into the current folder so it's going to not create a new folder with all of those assets it's just going to put it into that folder but you'll see that in a second so let's go on ahead and clone that and we'll take a look Okay, so that's now finished cloning. And if we open up our AMPR folder again, you can see that we've got all of our stuff. So you can see we've got a bunch of different files. So we've got some checkpoints. We've got a git ignore file. Again, you can probably ignore all of these folders. The core one that we're going to be leveraging is this notebook here. So it's detection.ipynb. Now, again, we're going to be working mainly with Jupyter Notebooks in this tutorial. I know I'm a data scientist. I can't help but using Jupyter Notebooks. But again, if you wanted to do this inside a PyCharm or a separate IDE, you could do that. You just need to remove 
the magic commands from the notebook in order to be able to leverage that. I'll maybe talk about that a little bit later, or if you want to see a video on that, by all means, hit me up in the comments below. But for now, I sort of wanted to show you what we've gone and cloned down. And you can see that we haven't actually created a new folder in here. So it's just gone and cloned all of the stuff from that TFOD course folder into our AMPR folder. And that's the advantage of adding that dot to the end to say clone it into the current folder. Okay, so we're good in that respect now. Now, what we need to do is actually go through the different steps from this GitHub repository. So I've gone and written up a really detailed walkthrough to actually get through all of this stuff. So ideally, this should mean that it's a little bit easier to get up and running. Now, what we need to do is create a new virtual environment, activate that environment, and then we need to install a bunch of dependencies and then walk through our specific notebook. So let's go on ahead and do that. So first up, we're going to create a new virtual environment. So if I bring up that same command prompt, let's just clear this. Let's create a virtual environment. So to do that, I'm going to write Python dash M V E N V and then the name of the virtual environment. So I'm going to call it AMPR, AMPR sys. So this basically, you can name it whatever you want. I'm just calling it AMPR sys because we're building an AMPR system. But again, you can play around with this. So Python dash M V E N V AMPR sys. Now, if we run that, this will create our virtual environment. And that's our virtual environment created. So again, if we go into the folder that we're working from, you can see that we've now got this AMPR sys folder here. So that is the beginnings of our virtual environment created. Now, what we actually wanna do is activate that virtual environment. So if we go back into our Jupyter Notebook or go back into the GitHub repository, you can see step three is actually activate your virtual environment. Now depending on whether or not you're running on a Linux machine or a Windows machine, the way to activate that environment is going to be slightly different. If you're on a Linux machine, it's going to be source, tfod, forward slash bin, forward slash activate. If you're on a Windows machine, it's going to be dot backward slash tfod, forward slash scripts, or backward slash scripts, backward slash activate. And the tfod bit over here is going to be the name of your virtual environment. So we've gone and changed ours as going to be dot ampr sys or ampr sys, so we just need to make sure we change that command appropriately. So let's go on ahead and activate a virtual environment. Cool, so that is our virtual environment now activated. So all I wrote there was dot backward slash AMPR sys backward slash scripts backward slash activate. So that you can see there that we've now gone and activated that virtual environment. So this little set of brackets plus AMPR sys means that we're now operating within that virtual environment. Now, what we need to do is install a couple of dependencies in order to get this up and running. So if we go back to our Jupyter Notebook, we'll go back to our GitHub repository, we effectively need to run these commands here. So again, this first one is going to upgrade our pip version that we're working with. This next one is going to install ipykernel, and ipykernel is going to allow us to leverage our virtual environment inside of our Jupyter Notebooks. So again, if you want a crash course on working with Jupyter or a crash course on installing Jupyter, Again, I'll link the full-blown installation video in the description below, so you can take a look at that. But in this case, we're going to go on ahead and install our IPy kernel first, then we'll do this line, and then I'll show you how to do that line there. So let's go on ahead and do this. So first up, we're going to install IPy kernel. So to do that, we can run python -m pip install IPy kernel, and this is going to install IPy kernel. And ipykernel is actually going to allow us to associate our virtual environment to our Jupyter Notebook. I'm probably repeating myself a bunch, but I like to sort of reinforce that concept. And I'll show you that once we've actually gone and set that up, where you can actually leverage or see all of those um, different kernels available inside of your Jupyter Notebook. So let's let that run for a sec, and then we'll go and upgrade pip, and then we'll go and install our AMPR sys virtual environment into our Jupyter Notebook. Cool, so that's now gone and done. And you can see down here that it's saying, hey, you should consider upgrading via the Python dash M pip install up dash dash upgrade pip command. Well, let's go on ahead and do that. So this is basically going to update our pip or our Python package manager inside of our particular virtual environment. So we can just copy this command and paste that down here. So the full command is Python dash M pip install dash dash upgrade pip. So it's really just going to be upgrading this pip library here. So let's go and run that. And again, this is all pretty standard. I cover this inside of the GitHub repo. So you'll be able to pick that up and take a look. 
Now that one ran pretty quickly. So the next thing that we need to do now is actually go on ahead and associate our virtual environment to our Jupyter Notebook. So we now need to go and associate AMPR Sys to our Jupyter Notebook. Now I'll show you what this actually looks like if we don't have it done, right? So if I start up a Jupyter Notebook by just typing in Jupyter Notebook, when we start up this notebook, you'll actually see that we don't have AMPR Sys in there. So if I hit new over here, you can see I've got all of these different virtual environments. I've got one called Python 3, one called GPT Neo from our GPT Neo video, one called Hands, one called RL Course, and one called TFOD. But right now we don't have AMPR Sys in there. So we actually need to go and install it to be able to have it in there. Now I'm gonna close this down, go back to our command prompt and stop Jupyter Notebooks just by hitting Control C. And what we wanna do now is install AMPR Sys as a virtual environment into our Jupyter Notebook. So let's go on ahead and do that. So to do that, we can write Python dash M, IPy kernel install dash dash name, and then whatever the name of our virtual environment is. So in this case, it's gonna be AMPR Sys. So let's take a look at that full command. So the command is Python dash M, and then we're going to be using the IPy kernel library that we just installed. So then we've written IPy kernel install, and then we're passing through the name of the virtual environment that we want to use. So dash dash name equals AMPR sys. So this will effectively allow us to use our virtual environment inside of our Jupyter notebook. Now, often I'll hear clients or people that are working with virtual environments and they'll go, hey, Nick, I installed everything into my environment, but when I go and start my Jupyter notebook, it's still saying it's not there or it's not actually appearing. More often than not, this is because the kernel that you're working with inside of Jupyter is not the same kernel that you're installing your Python dependencies in. Doing it via this route means that you're going to be working with the same environment, regardless of whether you're working from the command line or from your Jupyter notebook. So let's go on ahead and install this. Cool, so you can see that we've now gone and installed it. So it said installed kernel spec AMPR sys in C backward slash program data, backward slash Jupyter, backward slash kernels, backward slash AMPR sys. Again, this path might be different depending on what computer you're working on or what type of environment you're working on. But ideally you should see that it's installed successfully. Now what we can go on ahead and do is kick this off. So if I start Jupyter Notebooks now, when we go and take a look, we should effectively have AMPR Sys available there now. So if I select new, you can see that we've got AMPR Sys there. So that's our virtual environment now installed on our machine and available inside of our Jupyter Notebook. So we're all good to go in that respect. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and install the TensorFlow Object Detection API. This process can be pretty tricky. So again, it might take a couple of steps, but I'll show you how to work through this. And again, if you have problems, by all means, hit me up in the comments below, join the Discord server if you need some help. We're always pretty active on there. And we've also got an error guide inside of the TFOD course documentation. Now, I'm just gonna zoom in on this a little bit. So from our Jupyter Notebook environment, I'm just going to open up this training and detection notebook that you can see here. So it's called 2.traininganddetection.ipynb. So let's go on ahead and open this. And now what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're currently working with the AMPR sys kernel. So you can see over here right now, it's showing up as TFOD. This is from a previous video. So what we need to do is choose kernel change kernel, and then choose AMPR sys. And ideally you should see that we're now operating inside of the AMPR sys kernel or virtual environment. So we're now good to go. Now, this particular notebook is gonna walk you through everything that you need to go through in order to get up and running with TensorFlow object detection. That includes setting up all of your folder structures, actually getting your model up and running, everything that you really need to be able to go and do to get this up and working. Now, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we get the TensorFlow Object Detection API up and running because that is going to be what gives us the ability to perform object detection. So what we're basically going to go on ahead and do is just hit Shift Enter to go through each one of these cells. Now, the first couple should work all fine. So you can see that we're up to step zero, set up paths. This initial block is really just going to set up our folder structure. So if I go back into the folder that we're operating in, you can see that we've now got this TensorFlow folder and inside of here, we've got a whole bunch of different folders. Now, 
As you actually go through this, it's actually going to go on ahead and set up all the different folders that you need. Or if you want a deeper description or deeper walkthrough as to what each one of these folders does, by all means, do check out the full TensorFlow object detection course. So that is all well and good. Okay, cool. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually go through step one, which is download our TF models, pre-trained models from the TensorFlow model zoo and install TensorFlow object detection. It's probably a lot there. So what we're actually going to be doing when we use the TensorFlow object detection API is we're actually using a pre-trained state of the art model and we're just fine tuning that particular model on our specific use case. This is often referred to as transfer learning. So we're gonna leverage the knowledge that's already inside of our object detection model or those pre-trained object detection models. And we're just gonna fine tune it to be able to detect license plates. Now, in order to do this, we need to actually clone down the pre-trained model, which happens a little bit later on down here. And we need to make sure that we've got the TensorFlow object detection API installed. Now I'm just gonna clear these cells just to make it a little bit cleaner. So what we're going to do is start kicking that off. Now, in order to do this, you just need to hit shift enter and go through these cells. And ideally it should all just walk through for you. So I've gone and set this up so you can just sort of step through it. So if I hit shift enter, it's going to install a wget and wget is going to be used to go and grab our pre-trained models. Then this next one is actually going to go on ahead and clone all of our TensorFlow model stuff. So if I show you what that looks like, it's actually going to go to this particular repository and clone down the TensorFlow model garden. So inside of here, you've got a whole bunch of the research that's actually happening from the TensorFlow model team, as well as the object detection API components. So what we're going to do is shift enter through that and that will clone down that repository. Now that might take a little bit of time to clone, but as soon as it's done, you're going to see the TensorFlow model garden inside of this folder here. So inside of AMPR TensorFlow models. So we'll let that run for a little while and we'll be right back. Alrighty, so that took absolutely forever because my internet is quite slow, but you can see that we've now got all of our TensorFlow model zoo stuff now cloned down into that TensorFlow models repository. So you can see that everything that we had inside of that folder that I showed you inside of GitHub is now here. Now we're specifically going to be leveraging the stuff inside of the research and object detection folder. So this contains a whole bunch of repository or a whole bunch of resources that are actually all around the object detection use case. Now, in this case, we're going to be using a bunch of stuff from here, but again, I've sort of made it a little bit easier to walk through by using that notebook. So that's all well and good. We've now gone and cloned that down. Now, the next thing that we actually need to do is actually go on ahead and install the TensorFlow object detection model. Now, this will take a couple of goes. So if you do get stuck, sort of don't hesitate and freak out. It is going to take a little bit of time to get this installed. Now, what this is actually doing is first up, it's checking whether or not you're running on a Linux machine or running on a Windows machine. Now, depending on what type of machine you're going to be using, it's going to choose or run a different set of commands to get this up and running. Now I've tested this on Colab and I've also tested this on a Windows machine. So let me know how you go getting this set up. So what we're gonna do is again, we're gonna run this cell and this will start installing TensorFlow object detection. Now, the way that you can know that this is running is if you actually go into the TensorFlow folder, or if you actually go into AMPR and AMPR sys, and inside of there, go into the site packages folder, what you'll see is that it's starting to install a whole bunch of different types of libraries. Now, in a sec, what we'll do is we'll actually run a verification script to make sure that this is all well and running. But again, we'll come back to this in a second. So we're gonna let this run and then we'll come back to it. So first up, it's going to go on ahead and set up something called PROTOC, which stands for protocol buffers. And this is what the TensorFlow object detection model relies on. Then it's going to go on ahead and actually install the object detection API in these two lines of code here. So let's let this run and then we'll be right back and run our verification script and sort out any additional dependencies we need to run through. Okay, so it looks like that's finished running. So you can see that we no longer have our asterisks inside of our notebook. And it looks like it's gone and installed a bunch of stuff. Now, if we run pip list within our notebook, we can see that we've now gone and installed a whole bunch of additional dependencies. 
But as of right now, it doesn't actually look like it's gone and installed TensorFlow and TensorFlow GPU. So what we wanna do is sort of force prompt that into our folder. Now, rather than going and running that, we can actually go and run our verification script and see if this is all working first up. So you can see that there's no module named TensorFlow. So what we're gonna go on ahead and do is run this line down here, which will install TensorFlow for us. Now I'm gonna add in one additional line. So TensorFlow dash GPU, and this is gonna give us the ability to leverage our GPU. Now, a key thing to call out is that in order to leverage TensorFlow GPU, you do need an NVIDIA GPU. So in this case, I've already got an NVIDIA GPU on this particular machine. You can try using an AMD GPU. In this case, rather than using the TensorFlow-GPU library, you need to use another one called TensorFlow-ROCM or R-O-C-M. Now, in this case, what we'll do is, I um, keep saying in this case a lot, here what we're going to do is we're going to install TensorFlow 2.4.1 and TensorFlow-GPU 2.4.1. Again, if you wanna see in greater detail as to why we picked these particular libraries or how to map your CUDA and CUDNN version to your particular TensorFlow version, again, hit me up in the comments below or do check out the broader tutorial. But in this case, we're gonna install TensorFlow 2.4.1 and TensorFlow GPU 2.4.1. This is gonna give us our core dependency. So let's run that. And again, if we check our libs folder, you'll see that TensorFlow GPU starts installing into there in a second. You can see that we've got movement, it's all happening. So we'll let that run and then we'll come back and we will test out our verification script again. So ideally what you should see is when you run that verification script, right down the bottom, you'll get some, a particular line that says, uh, XX test run, I think it's 21 tests run and it should say okay. So if you get that okay line, then you should be good to go, more or less. Cool, so that looks like TensorFlow's now installed. So you can see it's gone and run through all of that. So if I go, or if we go and run pip list now, we should ideally see TensorFlow on there. And it looks like we've got TensorFlow 2.4.1 and TensorFlow-GPU 2.4.1. So it looks like we're good there. Now, again, let's try running our verification script, which is this line here. So you can see it says verification script. So again, this needs to be reading all well and good in order for this to be running. So let's run that and see if we get our OK status towards the bottom. All right, so it looks like we've got another error. So if you get any error that's sort of along the lines of module not found error or module does not exist, all you need to do is go and install it. So in this case here, we can see that we've got no module named matplotlib. Now, if I copy that and Google what how to solve that particular error, more often than not, it's just going to say you need to go on ahead and install it. So down here, let's take a look. Looks like we just need to run pip install matplotlib. So again, more often than not, these particular module not found errors just mean you need to go and install something. So down here, I've actually got this particular line which is going to install protobuf and matplotlib. So let's go on ahead and run this. And that should, uh, skipping matplotlib as it's not installed. Let's take a look to see if that's actually gone and run. Let's run pip list again. Okay, so it looks like we want matplotlib. So that was saying, that was throwing up an error for that first line. So the first line was actually going and uninstalling matplotlib and then reinstalling it. In this case, because it didn't have it, it's fine. It actually went through and installed it. So we're all good to go now. Again, when we run pip list down here, we should get our matplotlib version. So you can see we've got matplotlib there. Right there. So 3.2.0, cool. Again, let's try running our verification script again. And so the purpose of this verification script is just to make sure that you've got all of the dependencies that you're going to need later on to be able to go and run our particular model. So now we've got another error. So it's saying module not found, no module named pip. Now I know that this is the pillow library, but let's go and Google that error again. So you can see the solution to this particular line is going to be to run this line here. So pip install pillow. So let's run this. And this should install our pillow library. Uh, has it, it looks like it's successfully installed even though we're getting these warnings here. So let's take a look at pip list again. So again, you can see to solve those module not found errors, 
You just run that verification script, whatever modules it doesn't find, go and install it, run pip list to make sure it's now there. So you can see we've got pillow there. So that should resolve our module not found pill error. So if we go and run our verification script again, let's take a look this time. Uh, what are we getting now? So uh, no module named YAML. Again, this one is Pi. You need to install Pi YAML. But again, let's go and Google it. So you can see here that in order to resolve this particular error, you need to go and install Pi YAML. So let's go on ahead and install that. So I'm going to add in another line. Pip install Pi YAML. Run that. Okay, successfully installed PyAML down here. That's good to go. Run our verification script again. And again, I know this is a little bit tedious, but it, once you've got it set up, you're good to go. You don't need to run it again or don't need to install a bunch of stuff again. You can just go on ahead and leverage this virtual environment whenever you need to go and build object detection models. That is the nice thing about it. So once you've gone and set it up, you're good to go and build a bunch of stuff with it. This is looking more positive now. So let's scroll all the way down. Okay, cool. So right down the bottom here, so you can see that it's opened a bunch of libraries successfully. But most importantly is if you go all the way down to this particular line down here, you can see that it ran 21 tests in 17. Dot, let me make that a bit bigger. Ran 21 tests in 17.079 seconds and they were all okay. It just skipped one. So this means that you've successfully installed the TensorFlow object detection model. So again, it took a couple of iterations. We needed to install Pillow, needed to install TensorFlow, needed to install PyYAML. But once you've gone and got those installed, you're good to go. You don't need to go and do it again. I know it is a bit tedious, but once you've got it done, you should be fine. Uh, and again, if you get stuck, by all means, just hit me up in the comments below. I'm always happy to help. Now, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're able to install or run this particular line here, which says import object detection. If I run this, more often than not, it's going to say object detection is not found. To solve that particular error, you just need to restart your notebook. So if I run this, you can see it's saying it's not found. Now, if I hit kernel and then restart. Now, again, you don't need to go and reinstall everything just because you restart your kernel. It's fine. We just need to hit restart and we're going to be able to import that now. And what I'll do is I'll clear all of my output so we can see what cells we have and haven't run. So if I import OS, run these again, and then import wget. Oh, we don't need the seven there, import wget. Now, if I import object detection, you can see that it's run successfully. So sometimes you just need to restart your kernel to be able to go and run that particular cell. So we're good to go now. So we've gone and installed our verification stuff or we've gone and run our verification script all well and good. Now, if we run this cell here, this is actually going to go on ahead and download our pre-trained model. So remember, I was talking a little bit about transfer learning. This is going to download the pre-trained model that we're going to be leveraging so that we can go on ahead and fine tune it on our number plate detector. So run that next cell, so the one down here. So you can see it's going to be using wget to download our pre-trained model. It's then going to move it into our pre-trained model folder and it's going to unpack it. So it comes in a tarjz file. So this just uncompresses it. So if you get something that looks sort of like this, then you should be good to go. The other way to check whether or not that's run successfully is if you go into your AMPR folder, TensorFlow workspace pre-trained models, you should have this over here. So let me zoom in on that. So you should have a file which is called ssd underscore mob, uh, mobile net underscore v2 underscore fpn light underscore 320 by 320 underscore coco 17 underscore tpu dash 8. So this is your pre-trained model. So this is the model that we're going to be leveraging to fine tune to detect our number plates. Cool. Alrighty, on that note, that is step zero. So setting up our paths and step one downloading and installing TensorFlow object detection now done. Thankfully, there isn't too much installation left for the rest of this tutorial. We're actually going to get into the good bit now. So if we take a look, we've now gone and installed TensorFlow object detection. Easy OCR will do a little bit later. Now we're up to step two, working with our data. Now in this particular case, we're going to be leveraging a Kaggle data set. So if you want to grab this data set, or in this case, if you want to go through this tutorial, you need to grab the data set. 
it's going to be available at kaggle.com forward slash Andrew MVD forward slash car plate detection. So if we go to that link, you can see that I've got it there. And this actually already has a whole bunch of car annotations plus car images, which is in the perfect format for us to leverage our TensorFlow object detection model on. So what we're going to do is download these images. And again, you're going to need a Kaggle account to be able to download. It's going to ask you to log in, set up a Kaggle account, log in, download the data, and you should be good to go. So let's let that download, and then I'll show you what to do with it. Alrighty, so those are our images downloaded. So you can see down the bottom, we've got this archive1.zip. So we just need to go and grab that particular folder. So it's going to be in our downloads folder. And I'm just going to cut this. Now, everything in here actually contains our... So that particular folder contains the annotations as well as the images. So I'm going to show you how to work with these. So what we're going to do is go back into our AMPR folder. So I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see it a little bit better. So we're going to go into our AMPR folder, go into the TensorFlow folder, workspace, and then images folder. Now, what we need to do in here is create two new folders. So one called train and another called test. And we're going to paste our downloaded images over here to begin with. Now, from here, I'm going to extract all of these images. So you can see it's just going to ask me where I want to extract it to. So we'll just hit extract. And it'll take a little while to extract, but that's fine. It's going super slow on my computer. And then it should speed up. Now, once that's done, what we're going to do is we're going to split up these data sets into training and testing. Now, a core thing to note, let me actually show you what's actually in, in here. So we've got two folders in there. So one called annotations and one called images. So if I open up the annotations folder, you've got all of these files, which are XML files. So if we open one of these up inside of VS Code, so this is what an annotation looks like. So it's got our annotation, it's got the folder name, the file name, the size of our image, uh, whether or not it's segmented, the name of the object. This is super important. Now, in this case, all of the images have one object and they might have multiple objects. I haven't gone through every single image, but the object name is license and it's in lower case. Now, when we actually get to our second step where we actually need to create our TF records, I'll show you where you need to update this. So in this case, we've got our objects and we've got a bunch of annotations and we've also got the matching images. So if we go back into our archive, we've got all of the images there. So you can see that this is image uh, cars zero. So if you can see that, we're going to have a matching annotation for that particular image. So if I go into annotations, this is car zero. So this annotation here is the same, or this annotation here is the corresponding annotation for this particular image. So what we're basically saying is that this bounding box down here, so X min, Y min, Y max, and Y, or Y min, X max, and Y max, actually corresponds to this particular number plate, which you can see here. Now, what we need to do is we need to split up these annotations and images into a training and a testing partition. So the training partition is going to be what our object detection model is trained on. The testing partition is going to be what our object detection model is evaluated on. So we train it on one particular bit of data, and then we test it on a completely separate bit of data to see how well it's actually likely to perform. So on that note, let's go on ahead and do that. Now, this is really just a pretty straightforward cut and paste. So again, you should ideally randomize how you actually do this, but I'm just going to be a little bit lazy and just grab all the data. So I'm going to grab the four, uh, 0 to 410. Again, you could choose a different set of data, but I'm going to choose the files car 0 to cars 410 for our training data set. So if I cut all of those and paste it into the training folder. And then what we need to do is do the corresponding thing for our actual images. So these are the annotations. We now need to do the same thing for the actual images. So if we go into back into our archive, go to our images. So we went car zero. Let's just convert this to a list. Uh, what was it? Details. That's better. Car zero to cars 410. So we're going to cut that and paste that into our train. 
if I keep zooming in and out, that's my bad. So let's take a look. We haven't pasted that in yet. Okay, so that's looking good now. So we've now got our images and our annotations. So in this particular case, we should have what? 820 files. So, well, oh, it starts at zero, so 822. So in this case, we've got our images plus our corresponding annotations inside of our train folder. Now what we need to do is do the same thing with the rest of the images and the rest of the annotations into our test folder. So this is a core difference between using pre-annotated images and files versus actually collecting them yourself. But again, pretty similar to what you would have seen in the five hour tutorial or in the big TensorFlow object detection tutorial. So I'm gonna paste the annotations or the rest of the annotations into test. And then I'm going to grab the images as well. And paste those in there. Okay, cool. So if we go into our archive folder, again, there's nothing left in annotations and nothing left in images now. So we can actually delete this archive one folder now and delete our compressed files. So now we should be pretty good to go. So that's our data sorted. So we've gone and done a few things there. So specifically, we went to Kaggle, we downloaded our images. What we then went and did is we created two new folders. Let me bring this down. We created two new folders inside of our AMPR folder. And specifically inside of our AMPR folder, we went to TensorFlow, Workspace, Images. In here, we created two new folders, so Train and Test. And then we copied the annotations and the corresponding images into those folders. So we now should have all of our data actually up and ready to actually go and train this object detection model. That brings us to our next step, training our object detection model. So step three is training our object detection model. So we're now going to take the data that we just went and place into our train and test folder and train an object detection model to be able to detect the license plates. Now, in order to do that, there's four key things that we have to do. So first up, we have to update the labels. And in this case, we've only got one label, it's license. The nice thing about the TensorFlow Object Detection API is that if you wanted to train a multi-class object detection model, you could do that. So in the past, we've built models that are able to do sign language, so hello, uh, thank you, so on and so forth, as well as like really specific things like performing defect detection with a microscope or building a object detection app. So you can do multiple things with this. In this case, we've just got one label, which is license, as I showed you in that annotation folder. So then what we need to do is create our TF records. So TF records are the file format the, the object detection model requires your data to be in. Now, I've got a script that allows you to do all of that, so you don't need to do that from scratch. You just need to run through it. We then need to prepare our configuration. Again, really straightforward. It's all in the notebook and then train our model. So first up, let's go back into our notebook that we're working in and update our labels. So I'm gonna scroll on back and then go back to our notebook. And what we are then going to do here is go to step two. So step two says create label map. This is exactly what we're going to do. Now, in this case, we've only got one label that we need to work with, which is called license. So I can delete all of this stuff here. So thumbs down, thank you, live long. And all we need to do is replace this name here. And we're going to call it license because that is the name of the annotation of all of the license plates that we had in our downloaded folder. Now you can check this by going into the file. And if you open it up, what you're going to see is that this object has a XML tag called name. Whatever the name that is that you see in there is going to be or need to be the name of your actual label. So in this case, it's license. So we're going to call it license. And I think I've already made a typo. So it's L-I-C-E-N-C-E. -E. I've typed in L-I-C-E-N-S-E. -E, so it actually should be C-E. So those annotations need to map back through to this label map. So the name needs to be identical. Otherwise, it's going to throw a bunch of errors. So let's go on ahead and run this now. This will create our label map. So that's all well and good. The way to check what it, that's actually gone and done is if you go into your TensorFlow uh, workspace annotations folder, you can see that we've now got this file called label map, which is over here. And if I open that up, you can see it's just got one class, which is called license, L-I-C-E-N-C-E, -E, not S-E, and it's got an ID of one. So that's all well and good. 
nothing else to do there. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually create our TF record. So this first cell under step three is optional. This is really only required if you're running this on Colab. In this case, we don't need to go through this. We are up to this step here. So this is going to download the generate TF record script that I got from the official object detection tutorial. So let me show you this. So we're actually going to need to tweak this a little bit. So this file over here is actually going to go and convert all of our data from its raw format. So in this case, our images and our annotations and convert it to a TF record format. Now, because of a slightly different format for the annotations, we're actually gonna to need to update this script, but I'll show you why. So if we actually go and clone this repository here, so by running this cell, so it's the second cell under step three, this is actually going to go on ahead and clone uh, that repository or this script into our folder and it should go into the TF record script folder. So let's let that go on ahead and run, and then I'll show you where that is. Alrighty, so that is our generate record script now clone. So you can see that it's called generate underscore TF record. Now this is going to be what, again, as I was saying, this is going to be what allows us to create our TF records. Now a core thing is though, is that what I noticed is the data from Kaggle is in a slightly different format to what we normally get when we're labeling using label image. So if we go on ahead and run this script now, so this next cell down the bottom here, we're actually gonna get errors. So it looks like, well, the first one is no module name PyTZ. So let's go on ahead and install that first up. So this one over here is throwing up a slightly different error. So let's run that. So again, because we've got a no module error, we just need to go and Google that. So how do we solve that particular one? So let's Google that. So it looks like the solution is we just need to install PyTZ. Again, pretty straightforward, pip install PyTZ. Okay, so that's solved now. Now, if we run this script, it should be a slightly different error. Let's wait and see. Okay, perfect, cool. This is exactly the error that I was expecting to encounter. So in this case, it's saying index error child index is out of range. Now, the reason that this is occurring is because it's actually looking for the bounding box inside of the fourth object from our annotation. Now, what I actually noticed is that the annotation from the Kaggle data set is actually in the fifth object. So if I go into an example annotation, so if I go into images, train, and then I open up car0.xml, what you can actually see, now let me sort of explain this. We don't need that open anymore. What you can actually see is that the bounding box is down here, right? Now, what actually happens in that generate TF record script is it's going, all right, find the object tag and then go to the fourth object and that's going to, or object key four, and that's going to contain your bounding boxes. So what it's going to go on ahead and go and do is it's going to go zero, one, two, three, four, but you can see that difficult doesn't actually contain all of our bounding boxes. So what we actually need to do is change that index to index five, which is down here. And that should solve that particular error. So if we go into that generate TF record script, I'll show you how to fix that. So if we go into back to our root folder, TensorFlow and then scripts. And if we open up this generate TF record script, you can see down here, this is where it's actually going and getting the bounding box size. Now, all you need to do is change the four over here to a five, and that should allow us to pick up the bounding box successfully. So this is going to mean that rather than going to object four and try to get the bounding box, it's now going to get object five to get those bounding box metrics. So if we save this now and run that TF record script again, we should run successfully. And there you go. So we've got the line which is saying successfully created TF record file, successfully created TF record file for train and test. And the way to verify this is if you go into, again, we'll start off at our root folder, TensorFlow workspace, and this time going to the annotations folder, which you can see there. You should now have two additional files. So one called test and one called train. And as long as the file size is greater than zero, then you know that you've gone and successfully created those TF record files. And they should be in the format record file as well. 
Okay, cool, that's all well and good. Now the next thing that we need to do is copy our model configuration to our training folder. So this script under step four is actually copying over the pre-trained configuration for our pre-trained files. Remember we talked a little bit about transfer learning right at the start. Well, our model that we actually download from the TensorFlow model garden is actually in the format of a config file. So let me show you what that actually looks like. So again, we'll go into our AMPR folder, so YouTube, uh, where were we? Sorry, not YouTube, AMPR, and then TensorFlow, Workspace. And if we go to our pre-trained models and then this long folder here, you can see that you've got this file called pipeline. And if I actually open this up, this contains all of the details about the pre-trained model that we're going to be using. Now you could choose to use a different model. You could choose to use a more accurate one, a faster one. Again, if you want to see how this or how to choose these, by all means, do check out the longer tutorial. But in order to get this to work, we actually need to update a bunch of parameters in here. So you can see that you've got all of these lines which say path to be configured. We actually need to change this in order to be able to train our model. Now, again, this is all done within the Jupyter Notebook. So first up, what we effectively end up doing is we copy this config file from here. I don't wanna do it because I want the script to do it for us. It copies it from here into this models underscore my SSD mobnet folder. So what you'll see in a second is if I go and run this script, you can see that it's now going and copying that pipeline over. So that's all well and good. That's that step done. These steps over here now actually go and update all of those different parameters that I was showing you in there. So if I go and run this, well, let's actually take a look at the config before we make any changes. So if I open this up, can see no different right so right down the bottom you've still got all of these paths to be configured steps down here now if we go and run these cells down here and if we go and open up that config again you can see that that script actually goes and updates all of those configuration lines so you don't actually need to go and do anything additional to that it will do it all for you right now that brings us to the fun bit. Now we're up to training our model. So in order to actually train our model, we're now up to step six down here. So you can do this inside of the notebook, but I prefer to do it externally so that I can see the progress. Sometimes when you're running on a Windows machine, if you trigger this training script inside of your Jupyter notebook, you're not actually going to be able to see the output or the progress. So I normally do it externally and I'll show you how to do that. So what we're going to do is run the first cell under step six, train the model, and this will create our training command. Now, if I run the second cell and the third cell, you've actually now got this training command generated for you. Now we're going to make one tweak here and we're actually going to tune our model to train for longer. So at the moment, the, this particular model will train for 2000 steps. Now we want it to be a little bit more accurate than that. So we're gonna actually train it for 10,000 steps. So again, this is significantly longer, but will ideally give us a much more accurate model. So if we change that number, run those two cells again, you can see that this is now our full command to go and train our model with our number of steps set to 10,000. Now in order to run this, we just need to open up a new command prompt go to our AMPR folder. So I'm gonna go into D drive, CD AMPR. And this is gonna contain all of our stuffs as well as our virtual environment. Now in order to run this command, we need to activate our virtual environment and then run it. So let's go and activate that. So remember it's just backward slash or dot backward slash AMPR sys, backward slash scripts, backward slash activate. So that's the command to actually go and activate it inside of a Windows machine. Inside a Mac, it's slightly different. I believe it's source. Let's actually bring that up. Uh, it's going to be here. It's going to be source. And then in this particular case, it'd be AMPR sys forward slash bin forward slash activate if you're running on a Linux or Mac. In this case, we're on a Windows machine. So that's our activate script. And you can see that our environment is now activated. So we can clear our command prompt. And then what we're going to do is copy that command that we just went and generated inside of our notebook. So I'm going to copy all of this. And then all things holding equal, this should kick off our training run successfully. So let's go and try this out now. Now, again, we might get errors. If we do get errors, I'll pause it and I'll show you how to solve it. So let's run it and see if that runs. Okay, so it looks like we've got an error there. 
So this particular error is value error and numpy.nd array size change may indicate binary incompatibility expected 88 from C header got 80 from pi object. Now, this is actually a PyCoco tools error. Again, it's pretty standard. Sometimes when you run through and actually install this stuff, you're gonna get errors. To solve this, I've actually got the answer inside of the error guide from the GitHub repository. So let me show you that. So again, this is from github.com forward slash nick knock knack forward slash tfod course. All of these, are, so like I try to maintain a repository of errors in here. I haven't done it for a little while. Got to get back to it this weekend. But this is that error there. So value error numpy.nd array size change may indicate binary incompatibility expected 88 from C header got 80 from pi object. If you take a look at the error that we just got, it is exactly that, All right? So let me bring that a little bit better. So that error there is exactly this. So you can see that over there. Now, in order to solve this, you just need to reinstall PyCoco tools as I've got in this guide. So let's go on ahead and run these two commands. So first up, we uninstall it, and then we go and reinstall it. Let's do that again, PyCoco tools. Okay, so it looks like it's successfully installed. We're getting a whole bunch of these warnings. Again, you can just ignore those. So it's gone and successfully installed Cython and PyCoco tools. Now let's just clear this and try running our training command again. So I'm just going to copy that command because we copied and pasted a bunch of stuff. Paste that in and let's see what happens now. Now we're getting no module in named CV2. So this is an open CV error, which is a little bit weird, but we can do that or install that relatively easily. So we can just type in pip install open CV dash Python. That looks fine. Let's try running our training command again. Let's clear this. So again, sometimes when you go to in run it, you're going to get these module errors. Just go on ahead and walk through them exactly as we did during the initial setup. So let's run this. Third time's a charm. I'm crossing my fingers. No module named TensorFlow add-ons. All right. So we now need to go and install TensorFlow add-ons. Again, as usual, we're just going to copy this. Let's take a look at how we install that. More often than not, it's just a pip install. So you can see pip install tensorflow dash add on. So let's go and run that. I'm just going to run that command. All right. That looks like it's successfully installed tensorflow add ons down here. All right. What is this? Fourth time's a charm now. Let's try running our training command. This is all common. So if you're getting errors like this, this is not uh, uncommon. Let's see this. Okay, this is looking promising. Uh, no module named Jin. All right, we need to install Jin now. And again, so this one to run that pip install Jin config. So let's copy that. Okay, that's Jin config installed. Let's try running our training command again. Okay, this is looking promising. So. Again, if you get those module not found errors, you just need to go on ahead and install those libraries. Now, when I went and ran that training command, you can see that it's going through all of this stuff is popping up. This means that your training looks like it's running successfully. So ideally, you'll know that your training has now fit, formally kicked off once you get your first lost metric pop up. So I'll show you what that looks like in a sec, and then we'll step away, let it run, and then we'll come back. Alrighty, so this is what you should see once your training is kicked off successfully. So you can see here that we're getting TensorFlow, we're getting how long it's taking to train per step. So step 100, and it's taking 0.386 seconds per step. And we're also getting some loss metrics. Now in this case, we want our loss metric to be as low as possible to ideally get a model which is performing well. So again, we're going to let this train and ideally by the end of the 10,000 steps. So we should be able to see and test out our model, which is then being fully trained. So we'll let that run and then we'll be right back. Alrighty, and that is our object detection model now trained. So you can see we went all the way up to step 10,000 and that took a, or overall it was taking a time of about 11 to, or 0.11 to 0.12 seconds per step. 
The final run that we sort of had through this left us with a loss of 0.406. But you can see all the way through, it sort of varied up and down all the way up to 0.6 and down to around 0.2, I think, was the lowest I saw. But again, this is our model now trained. Now, if you actually go in to the, so if we go back into our AMPR folder, into TensorFlow, Workspace Models, and then my SSD MobNet, you can see we've got a checkpoint all the way up to checkpoint 11. So this checkpoint is actually the latest instance of our train model. And it's exactly what we're going to be able to use to go and be able to perform our AMPR. Now on that note, however, we have now gone and finished the training of our object detection model. So we went and updated our labels, we created our TF records, prepared our configuration and trained it. Now it's time to go and detect our plates. So in here, what we're actually going to be able to do is detect our plates from an image. So we'll be able to go and grab out our license plate. We'll also be able to detect plates in real time. So what we can actually do is we can use that same model, hold up our phone or hold up a instance of a plate. You could even deploy this in real time and go and run it out in the field. And you're going to be able to extract the plate or at least detect the plate then eventually what we're gonna do is apply the OCR components. So in this case, let's go on ahead and test out our model. So we went to all that work, we may as well go and test it out. So again, we're going to jump back into our notebook in this particular case, and this is all still running. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go on ahead and skip on down to step eight, which is load train model from checkpoint. So if we go and run this, what we now need to do is in this line here, we need to change the checkpoint that we're actually going to be loading into our model. Now, remember I was showing that the latest checkpoint was checkpoint 11. So all we need to do is change this line here, which says checkpoint or ckpt.restore. And then it's got a big file path. We just need to change this little component here, which you can see right now it says checkpoint five, just need to change that to checkpoint 11. So if we go and load that, this is going to load up our model into our Jupyter Notebook and allow us to perform some object detection. So then if we go to step nine, we can detect from an image. So if I run that cell and run our category index, all we need to do to actually perform some detection is change the file path for our particular image. Now, in this case, we're looking inside of the test folder and at this particular file name here, but this is not a valid file name. We need to get an image from our data set. So let's go on ahead and grab a file from our images. So if we go into, again, our root folder, AMPR, then go into TensorFlow, Workspace, Images, and then Test. Let's say we wanted to detect uh, this particular plate here. So this one is a Viper by the looks of it. So say, for example, we wanted to go and do that. So let's grab that file name. So it's going to be cars411.png. So if we go and replace this file name here, .png. And then if we go and run this next cell, this is actually going to go on ahead and perform our detection. So if we run this, let's take a look. And there you go. So it's now gone and accurately detected the plate from our car. So in this case, it's gone and done on this particular image and it's detected that that's our number plate there. So you can see it's Viper. Now, if we went and did it on a different image, we could do that as well. So let's grab uh, this image here, so 425. So all we need to do to do it on a different image is just change the file name here. Let's run it again. You can see it's gone and accurately detected that as well. So you can see it's actually performing reasonably well when we're actually going and go on ahead and detect our number plates. Now, this is a key thing and a key reason that I've architected this to use object detection, because what you'll notice is that the plates actually vary, right? So the Viper plate actually had a different format. This R8 plate had a different format. So you want to ideally or leverage this object detection model because it's going to perform much better than leverage, uh, leveraging traditional computer vision methods. Now in this particular case, let's go and try it out from our webcam. So I'm going to run this next cell, which is cell 10. And let's see if we can go and detect a license plate from our webcam. So I'm going to get my phone out and find a plate. Let's see. So as soon as you run this cell, you should get a little pop-up down the bottom and you can see it's detecting my head. Now let's get an image of a number plate and see if it's detecting that. Let's rotate it. Let's see that. So you can see it's accurately detecting the plate from my phone. Pretty cool, right? And it's doing it with reasonable degree of accuracy in spite of the reflection that's appearing. 
So you can see already we've already done the bulk of the work. So we're now able to grab our plate and detect our different plates in real time. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually start performing a little bit of OCR. Now, specifically what we're going to do for that is actually extract the region that we need and then go on ahead and actually apply our OCR. But as it is, if you just wanted to go and build a license plate detector, you've sort of got that up and running now. It's all working. It's able to detect different plates. What we're going to go on ahead and do now, though, is take this a little bit further and start applying our OCR. So that brings us to step five, applying our OCR. Now, in order to do this, we're going to be using our library called Easy OCR. So this is going to allow us to take the text or detect text from our particular image and work out what's actually being rendered there. Now, again, if you wanted to use a different OCR engine, you definitely could. This one's an open source one, hence why I'm using it. There are more accurate OCR models out there. So if you wanted to take this, by all means, go ahead and check that out. Now, key thing is that Easy OCR does run on PyTorch, which means that we need to give a little bit of room to our GPU to be able to go on ahead and run OCR. As that right now, if I actually show you my performance, so right now my GPU is almost completely consumed by TensorFlow. And by default, this is what TensorFlow is going to do. It's gonna take up all of the GPU that you've got available and not leave anything else. Now, what we're going to need to do is allocate a little bit of GPU to or leave some GPU remaining so that we can run our PyTorch components. So I'll show you how to do all of that now. So let's go on ahead and jump back into our notebook. Now, what I'm actually going to do first up is we're going to restart our kernel and this should ideally release our GPU. So let me show you this. So right now it's all consumed. Now, if we go and restart our kernel, what you'll see is that we'll release it. And you can see that we've gone and released all of our GPU memory there now. Now, what we can actually do is write a little bit of code to prevent TensorFlow from consuming our entire GPU. So let's go on ahead and do this. Now, I'm going to do this just above or actually just below this cell here, which is a load train model from Checkpoint. So we'll leave our imports the same. What we are going to do though, is we're going to add a new cell here to prevent GPU complete consumption. So let's go on ahead and write this and then I'll take you through each step. Okay, so before I go on ahead and run that, let's actually take a look at what we've written there. So we've written, let me just bring this into a single line. So it doesn't look as intimidating as what it actually is. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, five, six lines of code. Now the first line of code is actually going on ahead and grabbing our GPU. So in order to do that, written GPUs equals tf.config.list underscore physical underscore devices, and then we've passed through our GPU. So if we actually, or if I actually show you that line, so if we actually extract that out, so this is actually going to show us the GPUs that we've got available. And if we store that in a variable like so, or GPUs, we can actually take a look at what we've got. So in this case, I've only got a single GPU on our machine. So I'm just going to be setting our memory limit on that particular GPU. Then what we're doing is we're checking if we do have some GPUs available. So in this case, if we said if GPUs, print, yes, we have them, right? So in this case, we do have GPUs, so we're going to continue onwards. Then what we're doing is we're putting that inside of a try accept block. So if we do have a GPU and we can try it out, then let's go on ahead and run this line here. So this line is basically saying try colon tf.config.experimental.set underscore virtual underscore device underscore configuration. And then we're passing through our first GPU, which is our only GPU in this case, but you could loop through and do multiple GPUs if you had multiple GPUs. Then we're passing through this line, which is effectively what limits our memory or our memory consumption for TensorFlow. So inside of square brackets, we're passing through tf.config.experimental.virtualDeviceConfiguration. And then we've specified our memory limit. And that's actually spelled wrong, memory limit. That looks better. Memory underscore limit equals 5120. So this means that we're going to be allocating five gigs of virtual memory to TensorFlow on our GPU. 
And then we're effectively saying, if that doesn't work, then we're going to accept our runtime error. So accept runtime error as E and then print out E. So effectively, we're grabbing our GPUs, we're checking if we've got a GPU, and if we do, then we're going to set our memory limit to 5 gigs on our single GPU, and if that doesn't work, then we're going to print out the error. So if we run this now, ideally, this should limit our memory consumption. So again, it doesn't look like we got any errors there, so we should be good to go, and it doesn't look like our GPU's gone and fully consumed yet because we haven't actually loaded our data. So now what we want to do is actually go on ahead and load our data. So if we run this cell here, uh, we need to go and load in all of our different file paths. So let's go on ahead and run this. So to be able to load that, we need our file path. So if I'm going to run cell one, two, three, four, and then if we scroll on down, we also need the name of our labels. So if we run this under section two label map, and if we scroll on a little bit further, we're going to need this config as well. So now we should be good to go. So if we go and load this up, that's run successfully. And if we take a look at our GPU, so it looks like, so you can see down there that we've only consumed 5.8 gigs. So again, it hasn't gone and completely consumed our GPU this time, which is ideal because now we want to use easy OCR. So that brings us to our easy OCR component. Now, before we go on ahead and do that, let's actually bring in an example. So if we go and run through our image detection again, we're going to need an image to actually test this out. So I'm going to run the cell or cell step nine to actually go and detect our license plate. And I believe this was the Audi from last time. So let's see that run. And again, we've gone and detected our license. Now we can actually take a look at this particular line here. So this is actually representing our image with its detections. So if I grab this, you can see that from here, we're actually able to get our image plus all of our detections. Now our detections from our TensorFlow model are actually stored inside of this variable here called detections. So that contains a whole bunch of stuff. So if I take a look at that. So in here, you've actually got a whole bunch of different keys. And specifically, you've got the detection boxes, the detection scores, the classes, the raw detection boxes, raw scores, the multi-class scores, the anchor indices, as well as the number of detections. Now, what we're actually going to do with this is we're actually going to process that and leverage that to be able to go and apply OCR. Now, first up, what we need to do is actually import OCR. So let's actually create a new segment here. And I'm just going to call it. Um, so what are we going to do? So this is going to be easy OCR. We'll just call it apply OCR to detection. And then the first thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and import easy OCR. Well, we actually need to install it first. So let's go on ahead and install it. Okay, so to install easy OCR, all we need to write is exclamation mark pip install easy OCR. And you can see it's currently running. So we'll give that a couple of seconds and then we should be good to go. And that looks like it's all run successfully. And this will also import or install PyTorch. Now, a key thing to note is that this is going to install PyTorch without CUDA. So if we want to leverage our GPU, we need to go and install PyTorch as well. So to do that, you can just go to PyTorch.org. And then down here, we can actually go and grab the appropriate version. So we just choose our PyTorch build. And so again, this is all at the PyTorch website. So I'll include a link to this as well as the entire code inside of the description below. So we're just going to choose the stable build windows. We're going to choose that we want to install it using pip, using Python. And in this case, I've got CUDA 11 on my machine. So I'm just going to select CUDA and I'm going to copy this command here. Then, if we go back into our notebook, we can put, type in exclamation mark paste that in and I'm going to remove this three. So this is going to ensure that we actually leverage GPU acceleration when it comes to leveraging OCR. So let's run this and this should install PyTorch with CUDA acceleration. Alrighty, so that is easy OCR and PyTorch with CUDA acceleration now installed. Now the next thing that we want to do is actually import easy OCR. So to do that, we can just type in import easy OCR and that's all imported successfully. So if you get any errors, just try restarting your kernel. This should ensure that you're definitely picking up your latest easy OCR version. Now, the next thing that we want to do is actually go in ahead and grab our different detection boxes, which pass our threshold. So by default, when we leverage our TensorFlow object detection detection code, you're actually able to set this minimum score threshold. And this basically dictates 
over what certain threshold you're going to render your results. So in this case, it's set to 80%, hence why we can see our license plate showing up as 88% there. But if we set that lower, then we'd pick up lower quality detections as well. Now, what we want to do is actually apply that same logic to our OCR. So let's go on ahead and do this. So we're actually going to grab our thresholds over a certain level. First up, we need to set a variable, which is going to be our detection threshold. So let's do that first, and then we'll go on. Okay, so that is our detection threshold variable now set up. So in order to do that, I've written detection underscore threshold equals 0 0.7. So this is our threshold over which we're going to render our results. So if it's below that, then we're not going to bother. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually grab our image, grab our scores, our classes, and our boxes that actually pass that threshold. So let's go on ahead and do it. Alrighty, so we've gone and written four lines of code there. Now, what we're effectively doing is first up, we're grabbing our image. So image equals image underscore MP underscore with underscore detections. And this is the same as the image that we're getting from up here. Then what we're doing is we're extracting three different components. So we're actually grabbing the scores which surpass this detection threshold. And for that, we're effectively looping through each one of the detections inside of our detection scores key within our detection variable. So if I take a look at that, detections, and then type in detection underscore scores. So you can see that here, this represents all of the different or confidence metrics, right? So in this case, we've got one which is 0.884, which is the one that we had up there. So what we're effectively doing in this line is we're looping through each one of these values and we're only returning back the ones that surpass that particular threshold. So if I actually type in uh, whether or not it's greater than detection threshold. You can see that right now, only the first one actually surpasses that result. So what we've effectively got inside of this scores variable is just the ones or just the scores that surpass that threshold, which in this case is that 0.884 value. So in order to do that, what we've done is written scores equals list. And then inside of our list function, we've written filter. Now our filter is effectively what's going to allow us to loop through each one of those values inside of this detection scores uh, array here. So the full line is scores equals list, and then inside of that filter, and then we're using lambda x. So this is going to allow us to loop through each one of those variables using a lambda function. And then we're basically saying if x is greater than our detection underscore threshold, then it's going to bring back that result inside of that list. And then the second parameter that we've passed through to our filter function is actually the detection scores array, which is that there. Then we've gone and done and applied some filtering to our boxes and our classes as well. So if I show you the detection boxes section, these represent all of our box coordinates. And then if I show you the classes, and these are our box coordinates that are not resized for the size of our webcam. So we need to apply that as well. So if we take a look at our classes, these represent all of our classes. And in this case, we've only got one class, so zero represents license. So to do the boxes, we've written boxes equals detections, and then to that, we've passed through square brackets, detection underscore boxes. So this is effectively accessing a detection underscore boxes key. And then we're applying some index filtering. So in this case, we've passed through colon, len, and then scores. So this is effectively saying, grab everything that passes or the same length as our scores array. So in this case, we only had one value inside of our scores. So we're only gonna bring back our boxes result, which is that. Then we've gone and done it the exact same thing on our classes, but instead of applying our filtering on our detection boxes, we've gone and applied it on our detection classes. So if we take a look at our classes now, you can see that we've got our class back as well. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually go and grab our image width and our height because we need to recalculate our box coordinates with respect to our image size. So let's go on ahead and do that. And the reason that we're going to do this is because we're going to then apply some filtering on our image to grab our region of interest. So let's do it. Okay, so in this case, we've now gone and grabbed our width and our height. 
So in order to do that, we've written width equals image dot shape. And then we've grabbed the first value using some indexing. So square brackets zero to grab our width. And then we've gone and grabbed our height, which in this case, it looks like it might be the other way around. Let's just go and change that. So this should actually be as one zero. Wrong way around, my bad. Okay, so our width is going to be image dot shape and then grabbing the first value. So in this case, it's width. It's going to be 500, which you can see there. It looks like it's about 500. And then we've gone and grabbed our height. And our height is going to be our first parameter. So in this case, the full lines of code that we've written is width equals image dot shape. And then grabbing the second value, which is index one. And then our height is going to be height equals image dot shape. And then we've gone and grabbed the first value, which is index zero. So now we've got our width and our height parameters. Now what we can actually do is go through and loop through our detections. Well, in this case, we've only got one, but if we had multiple that pass that threshold, we'd actually loop through and extract each one of these and apply some OCR. So let's go on ahead and do that. So first up, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all of the boxes that we've got inside of this boxes variable up here. So to do that, we're written for IDX, which represents index, comma, box in enumerate boxes. So this is going to allow us to loop through each one of these. Now, what we're going to do is filter out the region that represents our region of interest, which in this case is going to be this region here. And then we'll go on ahead and apply OCR. So let's do it. Alrighty, before we go any further, I wanted to sort of show what we're actually doing here. So in this case, first up, what we're doing is we're grabbing the region of interest. Now, in this case, our region of interest is going to be our box coordinates multiplied by the dimensions of our image. So what we've written is ROI equals box multiplied by height, comma, width, comma, height, comma, width. So if we actually take a look at our box value, so let me print that out. Print box you can see that we've got all of these coordinates here, but these coordinates represent our coordinates for our detection without respect to the actual image size. So we need to multiply them by the height and the width to get our actual ROI coordinates, which if I print out here, you can see that these are before pre-processing, these are after pre-processing. So after they've been multiplied by our image coordinates. And then what we've gone and done is we've actually gone and extracted our region of interest. So you can see here that we've actually got our plate from our particular image, which is this over here. Now we haven't actually gone and applied any updates to our color. So if we actually went and plotted this out or change our color. So uh, if we did cv2.cvt color, color bgr to rgb. So remember when you're loading images or when you are loading images from OpenCV and visualizing them using matplotlib, you need to convert them from BGR to RGB. So by default, OpenCV is going to work with the color format BGR, but in order to render it using matplotlib, it needs to be in RGB. So if I do that now, you can see that we've got the appropriate coloring exactly as we had up here. Now to extract this region of interest, what we've gone and done is some indexing. So we've gone and grabbed our image, which we had up here. And then we've gone and passed through our coordinates, which we grabbed from our region of interest. So in this case, we've gone and filtered by our X and our Y variables. To do that, we've written int, and then to that we've passed ROI or region of interest coordinate zero, colon, int, and then region of interest coordinate two. And then we've gone and passed through comma, int, ROI, index one, colon, int, ROI, index three. So this line here is effectively going and filtering in through our NumPy array to be able to grab only the region which represents our plate. And then to visualize it, we've written plot.imshow, and then to convert its color, cv2.cvt color, we've passed through our region that we've gone and extracted, and then we've gone and passed through our color conversion code, which in this case is cv2.color underscore bgr to RGB, which gives us this but we haven't actually gone and applied any OCR now. So let's go ahead and apply our OCR and that should effectively give us our different components. All 
Okay, so in order to go on ahead and apply our OCR, I've gone and applied three additional lines of code. So first up, we're setting up our easy OCR reader. So to do that, I've written reader equals easy OCR.reader. And then to that, we've passed through the language that we want to use, which in this case is English. And then we're going and grabbing our result. So OCR underscore result equals reader dot read text. And to that, we've passed through our region. So we're actually passing through this block of, or this image to our OCR parser to be able to go and extract our plate results. And then what we're doing is we're actually going on ahead and printing that out. So print OCR underscore results. So if we run this now, we should effectively get our printed plate or the text from our plate. So in this case, it's getting vaguely all right. So in this case, it looks like it's gone and extracted our plate and this is the result there. So 6526GH or JHD, which in this case, it looks like it's probably grabbed the G incorrectly, but in, you can see it's a little bit blurry there. So it might not be as accurate as possible. So for a baseline model, that's not working too bad, all right? So it looks like it's getting a reasonable estimation of our plate. So it's accurately detecting our plate, might not be getting the actual text appropriately, but again, you could try a different OCR model if you wanted to. But this doesn't actually show one of the core problems that I actually noticed when building this up, which is if you've got multiple lines of text, sometimes the easy OCR reader or any OCR reader for that matter, can get confused between what is actually the plate versus what is just periphery text. So I'm gonna grab another image and sort of show you how this actually occurs and how to actually resolve it. So in this case, this is the image that I wanna take a look at. So you can see we've got bg02.qt, but then we've also got this text down here, which is not the actual plate. It's just the state that that particular uh, plate is actually referencing. So if I actually grab this image, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place it inside of our test folder and then we'll try it out. So I'm just gonna go into our TensorFlow, Workspace, Images, and then Test. And I'm gonna, actually let's not paste it in test because that'll throw off our training if we do it again. And I'm gonna paste it in there. So it's called test image two and it's not inside of our test folder. So we can actually run our OCR on this. So simply by going and changing this. So we're gonna remove that folder there and we're gonna grab the name of the plate, which is test image two. So let's do that, test image two. And then if we run our detection again, looks like we've got an error there. Images must have either three or four dimensions. That normally means that we haven't got the file path right. Oh, okay, so it's not inside of our test, which I thought we did. Let's check that. Is it PNG? Might not be. It's JPEG, that's why it's thrown an error. Let's try that again, JPEG. Uh, let's update our image path, run that detection now. Okay, so it's detected our plate appropriately, and you can see it's got a score of 0.91, which means it's gonna pass our threshold of, what did we have down here? 0 0.7. But you'll notice that there's actually some extra text in here now. So we've got New South Wales as well. So if we go and run our detection pipeline, so remember down here, this is going to run it. So if we just delete this scores bit and delete this height, so if we run these three blocks, which is getting the image, grabbing the scores, the boxes and the classes that pass the threshold, the width and the height, and then applying our ROI filtering and OCR, we should ideally be able to see the text that we get out of this. So let's run this. Now in this case, you can see that we've gone and grabbed a whole bunch of different types of text. So this is our result down here, okay? So we've got bg02.ot, We've got New South and Wales detected as well. So it's accurately grabbed the plate number. In this case, it said O is Q. It said Q is actually O. That's fine. Again, we've got to improve the OCR. We're grabbing the plate appropriately. Now, the problem is that, again, we are there is more text here than we actually want. So what we'd actually need to do is filter through this. So if I showed you the OCR result, you can see that we've actually got multiple results in there. So if we grab result zero, that is the plate. If we grab result one, that is new. If we grab result two, that is south. And if we grab result three, that is Wales. So what we actually need to do is apply some filtering to be able to grab our main detection, which in this case is going to be this region here. Now, the best way that I actually thought through to actually do this is to actually filter based on the size of the region. So the nice thing about EasyOCR is that you actually get the coordinates for the text as well. 
So in this case, this represents all of the four different coordinates for our particular image. So in this case, it's going to be 591 by 242, 836 by 242, 836 by 315, 591 by 315. So our particular region is going to be this region here, right? Now, what we can do is calculate the size of the text region as well. And we can actually apply some additional filtering based on the size of the text detected. So let's go on ahead and write a function to actually do this filtering. So I'm going to create a new function. Let's actually create a new section. So we're going to call this um, region filtering. Actually, it's really OCR filtering. And we're going to create a new function called filter text. And to that, we're going to pass through a couple of keyword parameters. So let's apply these parameters and then we'll take a step back and take a look. Okay, so first up, what we're going to do is create a new function and we're going to call it filter text. So to do that, we've written def filter underscore text. And then to that, we've passed through three arguments. So region, the OCR result, and then the region threshold. So the region is going to be this particular image here or whatever our plate region is. The OCR result is going to be our text that we've got extracted from easy OCR. So an example of this is that. And our region threshold is actually going to be a detect similar to our detection threshold. But now the threshold that we're going to pass through here is the size threshold. So in this case, say we wanted our, or we wanted to only detect plate regions, which, or plate text, which is 60% of the plate. Well, in this case, we'll more than easily pick that up because BG02QT is definitely more than 60% of that plate. So ideally it should filter out these detections down here. So let's go on ahead and apply this. So let's actually create a new variable for our region threshold. And we're going to set that to 60%. Then let's go and finish this particular function and we'll take a look at how it works. Okay, before we go any further, let me sort of explain what's happening here. Let's just print out the length, the N G T H and width. Okay, so our filter text region is first up going to calculate the size of our region. And effectively what we're doing here is we're grabbing the height and the width and we're multiplying those. So a standard rectangle area or area function for our rectangle. So width times height equals the area which is what you can see here. So rectangle underscore size equals region dot shape. And then we're passing through the first value, which in this case is index zero, multiplied region dot shape. And then we're grabbing our second index, which is index one. So again, that's going to give us the size of our rectangle. And then what we're doing is we're creating a variable called plate. And this is going to be where we store our results. Then what we're doing is we're looping through each of our results inside of our OCR results. So this is akin to doing this. So for result in OCR result, print result. So that's effectively what we're doing next. So we're looping through each one of these results and then we're grabbing the length and the width of that particular result. So in this case, what we're doing is we're first up grabbing our first key from our result, which is going to give us this. So if we take a look, result zero, that's going to give us all of our coordinates. Now, if we grab coordinate one, that's going to give us our initial coordinates. And then if we grab coordinate two, Oh, if we actually grab coordinate, this is going to be coordinate one. So what we're doing is we're subtracting this from this to be able to grab our length. So if I subtract those, we're effectively getting our length. Now, in this case, you can see it's inside of an array. So what we can do is just type in np.sum, and this is going to convert it to a single value. So that's giving us our length. Then what we need is our width. Now, in order to grab our width, we're just going to change the coordinates that we pull. So I'm going to grab the third coordinate and the second coordinate, and that's going to give us our width. Then what we can do is effectively we're going to multiply, and this is what these two lines down here are actually doing. Then what we're going to do is multiply those together to be able to get the size of the region for our OCR text. So if I multiply length by width, that's effectively going to give us the area for just this text here, and just this text here, just this text here, and just this text here. Then what we can do is do a bit of a filter. So if that particular region passes this region threshold, then ideally that should be our text. 
So let's finish this up and then we'll take a look. Okay, that is our filtering algorithm now done. So the last couple of lines of code that we've gone and added are if length multiplied by height, which are the length and the, uh, actually it should be length multiplied by width. Actually, this should be height, my bad. Length multiplied by height divided by our rectangle size, which is what we had up here. So effectively what we're doing is if the length multiplied by the height of just this bg.02.qt text. So if this region is more than 60% of the entire plate region, then we're going to return back that particular text. So if the length multiplied by the height divided by the rectangle size is greater than that region underscore threshold, then we're going to append the result from our OCR component. So if we grab a result one, that actually gives us our text back. So this BG02QT or OT is effectively what it's detected in that plate. So if we go and run filter text now, let's try it out, filter text. And if we pass through our region, our OCR result, and our region threshold, let's see if this runs. And you can see it's gone and only returned the text which has that, or the larger block of text. Now, if we drop that threshold to so say, for example, we set it to two, still grabbing everything. Let's say if we change it to 0 0.05. So you can see that it's now returning more text from that plate. So it's grabbing South and Wales. So again, this sort of gives you the ability to filter through the results that you're actually getting back from your OCR engine. Now, I thought that this was really, really important to show because what I actually noticed is that if you couldn't effectively extract just the components that you wanted, then you're really grabbing back everything from the plate and not just the components that you need. Now that's done. What we can actually do is bring this function or this component over here into one single function. So right now we've got sort of two blocks of code. So we've got this OCR code and we've got this OCR filter component, but we don't have it brought together. So let's create one additional function which brings both of our OCR components together. Now, I'm going to set up this function, but really all we're going to be doing is copying down what we've already written. So we're going to grab this component and bring it in here. And in this case, we can get rid of this image line because we're actually going to be passing it through raw and then tap this in. And then what we're going to do is grab our width and our height extraction, paste that into our new function, which is down here. And I'm going to comment this up just so we can sort of see how this all fits together. And then we're going to grab our looping. Let's paste that in as well. And then what we want to do is actually leverage our filter text. So again, we'll come back to that in a second. So if we take a look at our new function, so what I've gone and written is def OCR underscore it. So we're going to call it OCR it. And then we're going to pass through our image. A detection. So if we take a look, so right now the image that we're working with image MP with detection. So it's this. So if I type in plot .im show. So we're going to pass through our main image, which has everything in it. We're then going to pass through our detections. We're then going to pass through our detection threshold. And then we're also going to pass through our region threshold, which is what we need for our filter text, because we're going to call it from within there. Right, so and right now it's set pretty low. Okay, so that's looking okay. Now what we need to do is actually bring in our filter text component. Actually, let's comment this up first. So first up, we're grabbing our scores above threshold, scores boxes and classes. Then we're grabbing our full image dimensions. And then we're going through and enumerating through all of our boxes to grab all of our different components. So we grab our ROI. So I'm just going to delete all these prints because we don't need these just yet. So we're grabbing our ROI, which is remember our box coordinates multiplied by our image dimensions. We're actually extracting our region, which again is just going to give us this component rather than the whole image. We're then using our easy OCR reader to go and grab our OCR results. Now, what we need to do, however, is use our filter it method, which is what or filter text method 
to go and filter through all of the results that we get from our OCR engine. So let's go on ahead and apply this down here. Okay, I think that is our OCR it function now done. So we've gone and added, what is that? Three lines of additional code. So I've gone and applied our filter text method, which is what we just defined up here. And to do that, I've written text equals filter underscore text. And then we're passing through our region, which is this, our OCR result, which is this, and then our region threshold, which we had over here. And then we've still got our plot.im show to show our results. We're also going to be printing out the text that we get back from our filter text method. And we're also going to be returning that text back. So return text comma region. So let's go on ahead and test it out. So I'm going to create a new cell and we're going to call OCR it. Pass through our image with NumPy detections. And then we're going to pass through our detections, our detection threshold and our region threshold. Let's see that work. Okay, that's looking promising. So it looks like we've gone and accurately extracted our plate, and we've also gone and extracted our region. Now we're getting all of this other stuff as well because we still have a couple of stragglers in terms of our print. So we can actually remove this print over here. So we don't need that anymore from our filter text. And we don't want to, what are we also printing? It looks like we're printing out all of our text. Oh, we're displaying this region. So if we actually extracted these, so text comma region, sorry, my bad. This should clean it up. There you go. All right, cool. So that gives us our OCR detection method now. So we're, so if I actually extract or don't extract these variables, then it's going to display the entire region, which is this here, which is all this text, which are showing there, which we don't actually need. But when we do go to export our results, we do want that component. But in this case, we're fine for now. Now, if we actually extract those variables, so text and region, then we only get the results back that we need. So let's take a look and there you go. So to do that or test out our model, we've written text comma region equals OCR underscore it. And then to that, we've passed through our image underscore MP with underscore detections, which is the broader image. So this whole image here. And then we've gone and passed through our detections, our detection threshold and our region threshold. Now we could change our region threshold to make it a bit higher. So we don't grab this South and Wales component. So let's change it to 0 0.6. And if we go and run it again now, we should only get the actual plate number, which you can see there. So that's all working. Ugh, that is so good. So we've now gone and actually gone and grabbed the appropriate component from our plate. Now what we could actually do is go and apply this OCR method to our real-time detection. So this is sort of all doing it on a template image, but we could actually go and do it in real time. So what we need to do is just update this real-time detection method or this real-time detection cell that we've got here to be able to do that. So let's go on ahead and make those updates and then we'll test it out. Okay, so I've gone and written an additional four lines of code there to be able to go and apply our OCR in real time. So what I've gone and written is inside of a try accept block, I've effectively gone and just pasted or written this OCR at method down here. Now we're doing almost exactly the same. So we've written text comma region equals OCR underscore it. And then to that we've passed through image underscore MP underscore with underscore detections pass through our detections, pass through our detection threshold and pass through our region threshold. So ideally when we run this block of code now, when we actually go and trigger, it looks like it's still running, I should quit out of that. So when we actually go and run this, this should actually go and perform OCR on every valid detection that it's actually got. So let's go on ahead and test this out. So if we go and run this cell now, Ideally, you should get a little Python pop-up towards the bottom of your screen. And if it just pops up gray and closes, just run it again. Okay, so that's all well and good. So you can see, let's bring up a plate on my phone. If I bring that up to the screen now. So you can see down the bottom, it's detecting our license. And you can see it's actually in real time, it's detecting the plate. So again, there's a little bit of glare. Let's bring it back in front of the camera. 
Okay, bring it down. And if we go and take a look at our results, so you can see it's gone and detected our text there. So 6TRJ2LL. So again, pretty close. But again, you can sort of tweak this, use a slightly different OCR method. But again, it's detecting our plate and it's at least extracting some text. If we try out a different plate, let's grab another one. How about this one? Uh, no. Let's see if it's grabbing that one. Looks like it's grabbing it. There you go. So it looks like it's getting A, B, C, D, 5, 5, 5. A, B, C, D, 5, 5, 5. So you can see it's working. How good is that? So that is the first part of our OCR system now up and running. So it's been a, a long bit of a trek to be able to get to this point. But what we've now gone and done, and we can actually quit out of this so it doesn't smash our GPU. So if you open up the little pop-up, hit Q, and that'll close it down. So what we've now gone and done is a whole bunch of additional code. So we went and wrote the OCR code that actually applies it to our detection. We did our OCR filtering. We then applied or created our OCR it method. Now, the last thing for us to do is actually go on ahead and save our results. Now, what we can do is we can actually, because we've gone and done all of this pre-processing, all we really need to do is save our region and save our plate. So let's go on ahead and wrap this up and then we should be done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create another function above section 10, and this is going to be our save results section. So save results. I'm going to convert this to markdown. And then all we need to do is bring in two dependencies. So we need CSV, so import CSV, and we need UUID, import UUID. So CSV is going to allow us to save our results down to CSV, and we're going to save the image name as well as the plate detected. And UUID is going to allow us to uniquely name our images. Now, all that we really need to do is create a function to actually save our results. So let's go on ahead and do that, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, so before I go any further, let's take a bit of a break and see what we've got here. So I'm creating a function called save underscore results. So to do that, we're written def save underscore results. And then to that, we'll pass in through a few different things. So we're gonna pass through the text that we get from our OCR model, the region, so as in this over here, the file name that we wanna export our results to, and these are our text-based results, and then the folder that we wanna store our region images in. And then what I'm gonna go and do is create a unique image name. Now, in, this is the reason that we've brought in UUID. So UUID allows you to create a unique uniform identifier. So if I type in UUID.UUID1, this is gonna give me this unique identifier here. Now, the nice thing about this is this means that we're not gonna have overlap when it comes to writing out our images. So what we're doing here is we're creating some string formatting. So this is gonna create a unique file name which effectively gives us a unique file name .jpg for our image. So to do that, I've written image underscore name equals, and then quotes, squiggly brackets dot JPEG dot format. So this allows us to perform some string formatting here. And then to that, I've passed through UUID dot UUID one to be able to leverage and create this unique identifier. Then all we need to do is output our CSV results and save down our image. So let's wrap this up and then we'll test it out. Okay, that is our save results method now done. So I've gone and written an additional four lines of code there. So the first one is going and saving our image. So cv2.imwrite. And then to that, I'm passing through the folder path where I want to actually save that image. So in this case, I've written os.path.join, pass through the name of the folder that we're going to save our images in, and we'll set that up in a second. And then we'll pass through the name of our unique image, which is what we just created up here. 
And then to that, we're then passing through the image itself, which in this case is going to be our region of interest, which we had up here. Then the last thing that we're doing is we're actually writing out our CSV. So with open CSV underscore file name, and then we're setting our mode to append. So it equals A. We're setting our new line formatting as F. So we're gonna be able to work with our file as the variable F. Then we're creating our CSV writer. So CSV underscore writer equals CSV dot writer, passing through our file, passing through our delimiter, passing through our quote character and passing through how we want our quoting to be. In this case, quote minimal. And then we're using the CSV underscore writer dot write row. So this is actually creating our CSV writer here. This is actually using the write row method to write out our CSV text. So CSV underscore writer dot write row. And then we're passing through our image name as well as the text. So if we go and test this out now, let's just make sure we still got a region we can work with. That looks fine. Text doesn't look like we've got anything there. Let's just set it temporarily. Let's actually go and run this again. So if we bring in our image from up here, Okay, so that's looking good. Then if we, so that should give us our detections, right? So let's try this out now. Do we have text? Nope, we need to run our OCR on it. So let's OCR it. Cool, all right, so we've got our text now. Let's test this out. So text is fine, region is fine. All right, cool. So what we now need to do is set up a CSV as well as a folder path. So if we go into our folder, if we go into our root folder, let's just create a new folder called detection images, underscore images. So we're going to write out all of our image results or all of our regions to this folder here. So detection underscore images. So what we're then going to do is pass through our CSV file name and our folder path, which is gonna just be detection in images. Let's go and test this out now. Save results. Pass through our text, pass through our region, pass through our CSV file name. We'll just call this uh, detection underscore results dot CSV and then pass through our folder path, which is, remember is going to be detection underscore images. And remember this folder, so detection underscore images could be anything that you like. So if you change the name here, all you need to do is passed through a different folder path in this particular case. So if we go and run this now, that looks like it's run successfully. So it looks like we've got a detection results CSV and that's got the name of our image as well as our plate. So BGO2OT, if we go into our detection images, we've got our plate saved. So that is our save results method now done. Now what we can go and do is run this line of code in alongside our OCR method, and this should save our results as we're detecting in real time. So if we go and do that now, so save results, and then we're gonna pass through our text, our region, our CSV file name, so we should change this. So let's call it real time results.csv, and then we're gonna keep our folder name the same. So we're gonna call it detection images. So or we're gonna pass through the string detection images. So all we've done here is we've grabbed our save results method, which we set up over here. And then what we're doing is we're applying this just under our OCR at line. So this should effectively run save results. And then it's gonna grab the text, it's gonna grab the region, and then it's gonna write out our results to real time results.csv and write out our images to detection underscore images. So that particular folder. So if we go and run this now, this should kick it off in real time. All right, so we've got our face showing up there. Let's just bring our folder structure over here. Bring this over here. Okay, so right now we've only got that image, that one image, and that was from our initial test. Now, if I bring up the plate again, let's test this out. So this is the ABCD555 plate, so let's test it. Again, it's gonna go a little bit slow once we get our detections. So you can see it's now accurately outputting out our images. So I'll let that focus in a little bit. So you can see it's outputting out our images into our folder. It's making our detections pretty sweet, right? Now, if we throw up a different plate, what about this Texas one? Let's try this. So again, it's detecting our Texas plate pretty accurately. 
Pretty cool, right? So that's your real-time AMPR system working. Check it out, right? How cool is that? Now, again, I'm getting a little bit of glare because I've got some weird lighting at the moment, but if you had a better, uh, if you had better lighting conditions, this is obviously going to perform way better. Now, let's actually take a look at the CSV results. So if we open up real-time results.csv, you can see, so it looks like it's picking up some of them, but uh, you might need to tweak this. So it looks like the lighting conditions are throwing this out a little bit. So the actual plate was LHD8448. So it looks like it's got LHU8440. But again, you could play around with this, throw in some different plates, test it out, so on and so forth. But that effectively shows you what's possible with real-time AMPR. So we've gone and done a ton of stuff in this tutorial. So we went and trained our object detection model to be able to detect plates. We then went and set up easy OCR, built our OCR it function, built our filtering algorithm, and went and actually applied it in real time. Now, again, if you have any trouble with this or you need a little bit of a hand, by all means, hit me up in the comments below. All the code that you see here is going to be available on GitHub. So if you want to pick this up and run with it, by all means, do so and let me know how you go. But on that note, that about wraps it up. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this course. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell and let me know what you thought of the AMPR video. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace.